and I've had four combat deployments in my time. I've, I've had everything from high intensity tank on tank conflict to classic counterinsurgency warfare, uh, and uh, also training foreign militaries. So I've been in Afghanistan twice and Iraq twice over, over the years. So I've seen uh, up close and personal lots of combat and I understand what's capable there and I understand what things you can and cannot do, what, what war can and cannot solve. The South Korean military is well trained, it's well equipped, it's got some of the most modern uh, weapons of war, many of which were indigenously produced uh, and it's, of course it's got United States as, as a military ally. There is no way that Kim Jong-un could ever calculate that if he launched an attack that he might could win. That's not even possible, whether it's nuclear or conventional. Now, if you look at that and you, you look at it from just a rational analysis, of just a military balance of power, then you can say that there is no way that Kim Jong-un would use his weapons in an offensive way. He would use them as a deterrent because you have to look at things from the other side as well and many in the United States don't like to do that. And if you do, you see from the, the Kim's perspective, he's seen what happened to Muammar Gaddafi in Libya after he made a nuclear deal and then once he didn't have his weapons, then he was knocked out of power and, and murdered in the streets. Saddam Hussein was, you know, regime change there. He sees what's happened with the, the situation in, in uh, Iran right now with the JPCOA, we got rid of that and now that we're talking bellicose about them uh, again. And so he's got to say, well, what's going to protect me? And right now, I think he's calculated, I think pretty clearly, that having nuclear weapons is going to give him the ability to resist the United States from having regime change in his country. But it's critical to understand and that even in that case, they're not for offensive use because he's very, very wise and very calculated. And he understands that if he ever uses his nuclear weapons, if he even uses his conventional weapons, the likelihood is very high that he will be destroyed. If he uses nuclear weapons, for sure, he knows that he will be annihilated and wiped out. And he is, would have to be suicidal to use them in an offensive way. Now, if that be the case, then now that our actions are very different, and, and the way that we approach this is different, we don't need to look at this that if we don't get CVID, complete verifiable, uh, you know, denuclearization, uh, that should not be the primary objective. The primary objective should be the attainment of peace on the Korean Peninsula. If you attain peace, then possibly down the road, complete nuclear de uh, denuclearization becomes a legitimate possibility. Because if Kim Jong-un, if you accept that he has these weapons because he wants to deter the United States, well, if the threat from the United States goes down and down and down over time, then suddenly he doesn't have the need for that. But that is going to take time. And so in specifically about this summit right here, I think that if, if uh, you know, some of the reports turn out to be accurate and there is an end of war declaration, if there's an exchange of, of uh, diplomatic liaison offices, uh, you know, if there's limited sanctions relief from the United States, uh, in, especially in terms of inter-Korean development with the Kumgong uh, tourist location and the Kaesong industrial complex, uh, you know, those are, those are continuing steps that show that we're willing to do some things, that Kim Jong-un is willing to do some things, and then that lays the, the foundation for the next level and the next stage. But I, I think that in terms of reality, that if we get outcomes like that, that is continuing to move step by step towards peace. And every move that moves away from war, away from confrontation, and towards the establishment of, of peace on the peninsula, everybody wins on that. And we have to get a new mentality. Mm -hmm. We have to just get rid of that old way of thinking and look at things in a rational, calculating way with the understanding that we want to keep ourselves safe, we want to keep our allies safe, mm -hmm. and we want to you know, promote peace everywhere that we can, but we also need to defend and have that deterrent always sitting there, never blinking deterrent. But we need to put a lot more emphasis on diplomacy and a lot less emphasis on the militarized portion of it because that's the only path that we're gonna actually get to where we have peace as a possibility. Biggest mistake of US foreign policy is de demonize the enemy yes. so that they cannot rationally think. You know, I, I completely get That's one of the things that I talk a lot about. We, we need to stop doing that because mm -hmm. the minute that you demonize your opponent, 
now then you can't make a deal with him because if exactly. you're saying he's yeah. the the evil, he's the devil, you know, he's this bad thing. How can you talk to him? How can one? you then come back and say, oh, uh, but we're going to make a deal with the devil because uh. you've just told everyone he's all this bad stuff. Mm -hmm. What you should be able to say is this is this is our adversary, this is our competitor. We don't see eye to eye on here, but let's find areas of common purpose. Let's, where are the areas where we do have some agreement? Let's start from there and then work towards the ones we don't have. Now you have a rational basis with which mm -hmm. to conduct give and take negotiations that ha have ultimately a chance to win-win. But that takes a change of mentality. So what if they agree somehow behind the scene, but still not cannot you know, put it in a, a written agreement? Well, that's, as you pointed out, that is a possibility. Because when it comes down to it, I think it's probably unique among both President Trump and Kim Jong-un, both, both of them, that they are the ones that make decisions. And uh, I think that they, they delegate some level of, of authority to their lower level negotiators. Mm -hmm. But I think that, especially in the case of President Trump, he reserves most of that for himself. And, mm -hmm. and he makes a lot of his decisions, whether for good or ill, on a gut instinct and a gut feel. And he mm -hmm. has, in several cases internationally, been able to say, uh, you know, in a meeting with, with some foreign head of state or some other important person, he'll make a decision on the spot that the rest of his staff didn't even know anything about. And so that's entirely possible here, too. So really, that's why I say almost anything is possible to come mm -hmm. out of here. So what if there is no mention, there is no consensus reached by the two sides on lifting certain sanctions? Could this meeting be a, kind of like a tipping point? I don't think that it would be a tipping point. I don't think this is going to be a tipping point in either direction. Uh, I think this is just going to be another step along the way. And I think it's very clear, uh, Kim Jong-un has made no secret of the fact that that's his desire. He's, he said it in, in, in domestic messages. He said it in, in international settings. And, and we understand that. And I think that enough people in the United States at the senior level understand that's also in our benefit to see that developed because the, the more you're doing that, then the less you're thinking about making bombs and missiles and all that other kind of thing. Uh, but in the event that it doesn't, you know, they can't come to an agreement the way that we want to now, I think it would be a setback, but only a setback and something that would have to be addressed in the next round, whether that was uh, the, the Moon Kim next round or, or at a future summit or even a working level thing. Uh, so I, I think it's something we need to get to, to work, get to, and I hope that they do. Uh, but I don't think it would be catastrophic if it doesn't work out today. If there's one thing that has been that we could say conclusively about Trump uh, through the first two years of his administration is that he's very unpredictable. Uh, and in some ways, he is a zero sum. It's got to be my way or the highway. It's kind of a situation here. Uh, and certainly, you look at the way that he's dealing with, with the Iranian situation right now. There's very little even consideration of giving anything in that regard here. But when he perceives that he can make a deal here, he's willing to do anything that it takes. You've seen that. He, he talked about that a lot, actually, in his book, uh, The Art of the Deal. You've seen it in his past, in his uh, business dealings. And in the first two years of administration, he has shown that he is willing to throw the, the rule book out the window. However it's been done in the past, it doesn't matter. Uh, however he may have done it in the past, it doesn't matter. If he thinks that a hard line is what's going to work here, then that's what he's going to do. And if he thinks that, that uh, you know, say nice things about Chairman Kim Jong-un is going to work, then that's the way he's going to go with that, too. So I think the bottom line is Trump will do whatever he thinks is going to give him the best chance to succeed. And right now, uh, he seems to be on a, on a cooperative level with Kim Jong-un, and I hope that continues on.